your other dogs, all your other dogs like her? No. No. Oh no, they hate her. Oh my goodness. Ooh. They're all really angry at me right now. <laughs> Okay, so um, since we're calling this Group Therapy Friday, um, this call, uh, the question of the day is if you were anywhere but here, um, if you were like anywhere you wanted to be in the world right now, um, not on a Zoom call, where would you be? Costa Rica. And you just got back from there, didn't you? Kristen? I did, yes, I was there for two weeks. It was really nice. I went to the part where no one goes, so there are no people. It would either be Costa Rica or wherever Mary is or wherever Mike Bricker is. <laughs> Those are the three places I want to be. I mean, you're in Jurassic Park, apparently, Mary, so. Everybody's private chatting me to not forget things. So apparently I've been forgetting a lot of things on these calls. So I think I got it, but um, if there's something you're worried I'm forgetting, feel free to chat me. So the question, if you're just joining the call is, if you were anywhere that you wanted to be right now, where would you be? Faith says sleeping. That's not a place, Faith. In the garden? Technically, technically yes it is. <laughs> Uh, beach. I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to do a simple one and just say, where's the place we had the conference? Fort Lauderdale. That was a nice conference. Does anybody remember that one? I think that was a expo. Very relaxing. Or New Orleans. New Orleans expo was a lot of fun. Okay, so welcome everyone um, to the Group Therapy Friday Animal Welfare Leadership Roundup Call. Today is mostly a time to kind of talk about what's going on and hear from all of you. Uh, my name is Kristen. I'm with American Pets Live and get to help facilitate these calls. And uh, we have so many folks on this call, hopefully some new people joining us. So if you haven't been on one of these calls, or you haven't been here in a while, please introduce uh, yourself in the chat and tell us who you are, um, where you're from, and, uh, and also who brought you to the call, who recommended that you come to the call, because um, we have a, this is our last week for the Maddie's Fun Contest. There are gift cards being given away if you referred someone else to join this call. So um, let us know you are here. Um, before we get started into our agenda today, I am going to turn it over to um, Mary Smith from Maddie's Fund. Good morning, everybody. As you can see, I am fascinated by dinosaurs. And while I've never outgrown that obsession, it seems to me to mean more to me the older I get. These guys remind me that it's really easy to become extinct, <laughs> even when you're at the top of the food chain. And that goes for all of us in animal welfare. One of the things that we've learned from the pandemic is the need to change. And sometimes those changes have happened on a daily basis. And this past year in animal welfare, we've really been taking a deep dive into our own prejudices, judgments, and biases that have kept us stuck in the past. But the association is taking steps to change that with an historic first of its kind survey launched by the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. So here's what we need you to do. By end of day on June 23rd, take the survey. Allison will put a link in the chat file 
and you can go to the association's homepage to access the survey. We need to hear from everyone working in animal welfare, from the frontline folks, to the animal control officers, to your fundraising team, to your board, to your adoption counselors and managers, everyone. I took it. The questions are really gonna make you think, but for the first time, it's an opportunity to write down those things that maybe you've only felt. The survey is designed to be thought provoking, but it's gonna help chart a new path for us. So don't you wanna be part of that? <laughs> Otherwise, we're gonna end up like the decals on my wall and who wants that? So take the survey, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, okay, so I know we have quite a few updates from our national organization partners because a lot is going on right now. So if you are from a national org and you have an update that you wanna share, I think we should kick it off with John Dunn, who, John, it's so good to see you again. I hope you're gonna stay on the whole call because I'm dying to know what you think of some of the things we're gonna talk about today and welcome. Tell us what's happening at Best Friends. Hi, everyone. Uh, John Dunn, I am from Best Friends, filling in this morning for my colleague Brent Tolner. Um, I'm uh, next week. I'm super excited. It's our Best Friends National Conference. We are back last year, you know, just like everyone else, we had to cancel a conference. And uh, it's a huge bummer, right? Because the conference, at least for me, it's like my recharge, all the sessions and the people and the learning, uh, you know, catching up with old friends and young friends uh, and not ageist. Uh, anyway, it's next week, 23rd and 24th, Wednesday and Thursday. The deadline to register is Monday uh, noon mountain time. Uh, I think, I think we're over a hundred sessions now, which is pretty wild. Uh, it is gonna be virtual obviously. Uh, and you may say, well, that's boring. That's weird. I just have to sit on Zoom for two days. But our events team did a huge amount of research and found this platform that is incredibly dynamic so even though it is virtual, I think we're gonna find ourselves as close as we possibly can uh, and engaged. So again, uh, next week, deadline Monday, uh, it's $55 to register. You'll get all the recordings right after the event. So uh, even if you can't you know, be there for two days, sitting in your office because people are bugging you, guarantee you that's gonna happen, right? So you'll be able to go back and watch all the sessions and share them with your staff. Uh, and I have a special discount code for you. Uh, when you go to register, use the promo code podcast, all lowercase podcast, and you'll get $10 off. Uh, I was able to convince them to do that uh, if, uh, I, if it came out of my check. So every time you register and use that code, you are costing me $10 happy to do it because I want to see you there. Uh, bestfriends.org slash conference. I will put it in the chat and uh, can't wait to see you next week. Um, and if you are speaking at the conference, um, is anyone here speaking at the conference next week? You know, Dr. Jefferson and I are, Jamie, anybody else? Michael, you're speaking. What are you talking about? Sorry, I'm talking with um, Dr. Aaron, and we're we're talking about um, the relationship between shelter directors and shelter veterinarians. It's going to be a cool talk. I'm, I'm also I'm also speaking as well. And what are you uh, speaking about, James? Proximate leaders. Uh, just the the concept that um, our community work should be led by those in the community and not from <laughs> animal welfare on high. And Dara, what are you talking about? I am on the opening panel with um, Julie Castle and Denise Deisler talking about our partnership with Pinellas Cats Alive. Awesome. Faith, how about you? I'm doing intake to placement, how it can work at your shelter. Cool, and Jamie? <laughs> Uh, ecosystem mapping, so mapping the resources within your community. Cool, and if anybody else is speaking, let us know in the chat what you're going to be talking about. The lineup looks amazing. Um, and John, do we know how many people are registered? Uh, I, over 2,000, I know that. Uh, so easily the biggest Best Friends Conference we've ever had. And I think, again, it just speaks to, you know, the pros and cons of being virtual where we can 
uh, in this case, it's much more accessible, I think, in terms of the registration fee uh, and, and without the travel and all the other things. But like I said, I think it is really important to point out that uh, it is going to be very dynamic. You're going to be able to chat with speakers, I think, in a much more organized way and for longer than you would at the regular conference. You know how we like like all bum rush the stage after you know somebody speaks we're not going to do that we're going to have very organized chat rooms and you're going to have a lot of time during and after to be able to connect with the speakers so uh yeah i think it's going to be i think it's going to be a good one in its own way not the real thing and the real thing better be back next year but uh you don't want to sleep on this one thank you so much and uh, uh gina Tell us what, tell us, tell everybody for those who are just listening, can't see the chat, what are you going to be speaking about? What do you think I'm going to be speaking about? Return to home, of course, but this is a, really an opportunity to showcase uh, some of the great work that's happened in the shelters across the country. So I get to brag about several of you on this call. And every day I seem to be adding something new to my subsequent presentation. So keep up the good reunification work. Thanks, Gina. I hope we hear from you a little later. Uh, we About 60% of animals entering shelters are coming in as lost and stray. So um, that presentation is going to be really important. Um, OK, so welcome back, Esteban. I see you're back with us. We have missed you. Um, happy to have you here today. And what other national organizations are on the call that would like to um, announce anything going on that the group needs to hear? Hi everyone, it's Catherine from the association. Happy Friday. And uh, Gina Nepp and I want to remind everybody that the Association for Animal Welfare and Michelson Found Animals are hosting an Animal Welfare Summit July 29th and 30th. And it's a little different than I guess our normal work in that it's helping startups and entrepreneurs who want to work in the animal welfare space, helping them integrate well into working with animal welfare organizations. And so we're going to have um, there, Allison just put it in the chat, you can apply to be considered. So if you know somebody who's working in um, some sort of special startup or doing something new, and could really benefit the animal welfare sector, definitely encourage them to apply. And Gina, what, are, what am I missing? What else should we tell them? I don't know. I just think it's so important for us to pay attention to the pet market um, because we are businesses. And I know that all of you are periodically uh, contacted by a new startup or a business trying to get you to sell whatever it is in your shelters. And this is a great opportunity for those startups to learn from real real um, entrepreneurial business folks, not so much the animal side of the house, but product. Um, Michelson invests heavily in um, um, startup businesses. And I just think it's really cool that there's a partnership here because we're in the pet space, whether we wanna be businesses or not, we are. Thank you, Catherine. Absolutely. So we're excited. So spread the word and thank you, Allison, for putting it in the chat. Appreciate it. And this is Valerie. Um, I work with Catherine and um, we would like to announce that we are going to be having a face to face conference this November in New Orleans. We hope to see you there. So please save the date November 17 to 19, which does back up against the weekend. So those of you who want to get out, what's better than a weekend in New Orleans. So stay tuned. We'll have registration opening in early September. That is great news. Wow. Um, Catherine, you also, I saw you also, y'all are starting an LGBTQIA um, like affinity group. Is that right? Did I see that? Yes, we are. We're uh, really, really excited to be able to do this in the animal welfare sector. And um, what we're hoping to accomplish on July 14th, I believe, um, and we're trying to make it accessible to everybody across different time zones. So it's going to be at eight o'clock Eastern time, and then it will be five o'clock on uh, Pacific time. But the hope is to create a safe space where those in the LGBTQIA plus community can really uh, come together as peers and colleagues in animal welfare and have that safe space where they can talk about the challenges and the successes and the, and 
you know, what it's like. Um, hopefully some organic mentorship will come out of this, but um, it, we really want to create that space and um, two, uh, two individuals have raised their hand to sort of co-lead and facilitate these conversations. And it's um, Michelle Quigley, who's the Chief Operating Officer from Humane Society of Vero Beach in Florida, and Bo Archer, who um, many of you know is with uh, Humane Rescue Alliance in Washington, DC. And so they're gonna be leading and facilitating that group. So as soon as we get a little bit more information to get people registered who wanna participate, we will get that to you. Anybody else wanna make any announcements? Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Jerica from NACA. Just wanting to say good morning. Um, I'm presenting on Monday's Maddie's National Call um, and have some exciting things to share for um, NACA and some upcoming uh, pretty cool things. So hopefully I'll see you on Monday morning and wishing you all a wonderful weekend. Hey guys, it's Chelsea from Petco Love. Um, big announcement, our largest and most anticipated grant cycle of the year, the Animal Welfare Organization grant cycle opens on July 1st. We also have open right now a grant cycle for Unsung Hero. So if Rebecca is on this call, her organization has won it in the past. So we know there are some unsung heroes in all of your organizations and we wanna hear their stories. So again, 7-1 for the Animal Welfare Organization grant cycle. It's open 7-1 to 8-31 and Unsung Hero is open now. And this is Sharon from Maddie's Fund. Just want to let everybody know that we've got uh, uh, the Maddie's Pet Forum is open. I don't know if everyone has an account on Maddie's Pet Forum, uh, but there's a lot of great conversations that are happening and we're hoping that any uh, great stuff that happens on this call that you'll all continue the conversation um, on the forum as well. Uh, so excited about um, all of this happening and it is a crazy time in animal welfare and it feels a little bit like things are uh, returning to normal and um, that means that we need all the help we can get to keep our shelters um, at a reasonable capacity and we have Dr. Pisano here today to talk a little bit about how uh, her book can help us do that. So Dr. Pisano, over to you. I didn't know you were gonna call on me right now and I put a bunch of peanuts in my mouth. So let me just finish chewing. <laughs> peanuts, okay. Um, hi everybody. Let's see, I wanna share my screen and I have a, um, a quick presentation that I would like to um, present to you. And now you see my messy desktop. So give me one second. <clears throat> so my name is Dr. Sarah Pisano. I'm the founder of Team Shelter USA, which is a consulting company that helps animal shelters, could be public or private, reach their full potential. And I'm also over the University of Florida Assessment and Mentorship Program and Million Cat Challenge, part of the Million Cat Challenge team. And just for people who, um, especially those of you in open admission and public shelters, I always like to share the part of my history um, about open admission shelters. And when I graduated from vet school in 1994, if you said I was going to work in an open admission shelter or be a public shelter director, I would have thought you were crazy. Um, but after I worked at North Shore Animal League, which is a very well-funded animal welfare organization, I ended up in open admission shelters knowing that that's actually where I was needed the most. And that was a very, very difficult transition for me and a decision to say, this is where I can make a difference. And I ended up being a public shelter director. So 
that's really helped me um, help other shelters um, because on every single assessment, I can say to the public shelter director, I get it, I understand what you're facing. And that's been incredibly helpful doing assessments. So the core recommendations are our guidelines from the Association of Shelter Veterinarians, the Million Cat Challenge Initiatives. I'm the biggest fear-free fan. And of course, um, the Haas model is the same model that we've been teaching, right? Keeping animals out of shelters and all of that. Um, that culminated after my work doing um, assessments with the playbook because what I found was every single shelter I visited, wherever it was in the United States, whatever size organization it was, I was writing the same recommendations. It could be Dallas, Texas and talking to the municipal leaders there or going to a tiny county in Kentucky. I was having the same exact conversations with them. So the challenges that we all face in animal welfare are empirically the same. Of course, there's different levels, right? Um, and scales of challenges, but empirically, the good news is that the solutions are the same. And so, gosh, if I had a dime for every time somebody said one of these things to me, um, I'd be retired. I would be in the Cayman Islands right now, not on this call, but um, you don't understand. We're different because dot, dot, dot. So, you know, our commissioners don't care about animals. And guess what? I don't care that your commissioners don't care about animals. I'm not talking to them about animals. I'm talking to them about operating their municipality in a responsible way and eliminating waste and stopping complaints. And they're like, what? Um, we don't have the money. What we've proven is money is number two. Our perspective, program design and philosophies around how we operate our shelters and community programs is number one. Money is number two. We don't have the shelter space to do what you're saying, but in fact, we know, as we now know, right, versus what we knew 20 years ago, it's not about the space at the shelter being larger, it's about using the space efficiently. Um, same with staff. People, I, I always say, it's not that you don't have enough building enough staff or enough money, it's that you have too many animals coming in, so let's see how we can work that more efficiently. And then one of my favorites, our ordinances won't allow it, and, and people seem to think like, I'm asking them to go to the moon when we're talking about ordinance revisions, but remember, that's tied into number one, because they've not been able to be, um, been influenced, it be influencing their elected officials. But when we talk to elected officials about the facts and about how we can help them look better, do better, save money, decrease complaints, those revisions happen very quickly. And that includes municipal attorneys. And what I want you all to understand is that we are the experts in animal welfare. The municipal attorneys don't know the data you know. They don't know the system like you know it. So it's our job to educate them. And then it becomes super easy to revise ordinances. State laws are a little bit um, obviously harder to change, but what I found over and over again is that the state laws are being misinterpreted by the municipal attorneys or by the shelter. And so I always make sure I know those state laws back and forth because, and because a shelter might say, we can't do that because of our state law. And that just happened to me recently in a shelter in Mississippi, the municipal attorney said, no, that's a state law that there's a five day stray hold and it wasn't. Um, so all those years, the stray hold for dogs and cats was longer than it needed to be. Um, you know, we have a lot of cats here. We have, I always have shelters say that, you know, there's a lot of cats here, a lot of community cats. I'm like, I don't know any community that doesn't have a lot of cats outside. Um, the pit bulls, we only have pit bulls. Um, so pit bulls are, there's a lot of pit bulls in shelters because people love pit bulls and it's our job to advocate for them, right? But People, I think, um, feel that they're they're different when uh, it's important that we all share those same challenges. So at this point in time, I've been in 21 states in all different size shelters um, and all the blue states, um, over 100 
community and shelter assessments. And these are the trends that we wanna see. So the green is live outcome, the blue is euthanasia, and that's representing the outcome for one year. And so our goal is reducing intake, meaning I'm gonna use the shelter strategically um, at, only for animals that absolutely need help. For a private shelter, you might increase intake because you've got that capacity for care and your length of stay and plan of action out to live outcome is super quick. So you might want to be increasing intake. But this is for shelters, especially euthanizing for space, which is still happening in a lot of shelters today. So we want to say, how can we decrease intake of those animals that could potentially have other alternatives? So in Waco, we were there the end of, of 2012 and immediately intake and youth in Asia decreased. And it's really exciting to look at community like Waco, 30% poverty rate at that time, but it's an important lesson for other communities to say, wow, we have a high poverty rate too. And if they could do it, we could do it. And that's what's happened a lot with, um, with that particular Waco story. And so I'm always looking at is what I'm doing effective and it, am I accomplishing the goals that I set out to? And so early on, we looked at just 18 of the shelters that we helped and compared the euthanasia number the first year of the assess after the assessment compared to the year before. And I almost fell off my chair when that number was almost 48,000 animals. And there's two things that are important about this story. One, I have never been a funder, none of the, whether it's Target Zero or UF or Team Shelter, Million Cat, we are not funders. So we are just helping shelters implement best practice strategies. Number two, these are shelters that were not trending this way. And so when I saw these numbers, y'all, I was, I was humbled, but so heartbroken that I thought like everybody else, oh my gosh, we need millions of more dollars in my one shelter to accomplish this. And it's just not true. So if you take nothing else away from this, it is program design, philosophy about intake and outcome is more important than money. And so we all know about the traditional flawed open admission system, but a lot of times we are our own self-imposed barriers to live outcome. And we want to think about that differently. And this is a human brain issue. This across, this is just human. It has nothing to do with animal welfare, but we are a product of our own microcosms. And most importantly, for um, releasing barriers for our live outcome efforts is releasing our fears because our brains automatically trigger, trigger to the negative and amplify the negative, right? So um, we know that when we keep things in perspective, things change. And a perfect example is people being so afraid to adopt because you might be adapting to fighters or, um, you know, all kinds of bad people if we don't have a really rigorous adoption system, right? And we know that that is the very, very scant percentage of people coming to adopt. And that's a, that's a trust issue. The second thing to keep in mind is we have felt for so long, like I know I did, we're victims. Like there's nothing we can do about this. We're just like, how are we ever gonna get out of this hole? And it turns out we now know there's so much more in our control than out of our control. And we've proven that so many times now. And now this is the norm is the admi managed admission system. So flipping that funnel. And then again, um, what am I doing? What resources do I have? And how am I using them strategically? And so these I consider sort of the pillars, responsible public policy, targeted spay neuter, managed admission, of course, safety net, direct home to home placement. That's my previous foster dog. I'm not a foster failure. That's my successful adoption during the COVID pandemic. That's Potato Pisano, also known as the diva. Um, community cat programs, hands down, have created the most impactful change and transformation for shelters because once we stop clogging our shelters with cats that should never even enter the shelter, everything changes and that's been the most important springboard to change. 
And then certainly all the rest of, you know, prevention with Good Samaritan foster care, obviously open adoptions. This to me is one of the top issues in, um, in private adoption agencies is the open adoption issue. And that's the level of trust that, that we need to address. Um, and just a couple of more quick slides, just showing the impact of community cap programs. So 2014, when this is Metro Nashville and the result of pet community um, spay neuter clinic, remember the blue is euthanasia, the green is live outcome, holy cow, just dramatic, amazing progress. And these are, again, the trends that we wanna see and that when these programs are implemented correctly within the current resources, that the shelter has, this is what can happen, right? Over and over, it's proven. Um, in Greenville, what Shelly did the first year, um, when they implemented, I don't know if Shelly's on the call, but when they implemented community cap programs that first year, she realized that 2,000 less cats went into the shelter, Into I'm sorry, euthanasia was decreased by 2,000 as well, and it was budget neutral. And that's the message for our municipal leaders, right? That we don't need millions of more dollars. And so the playbook is just, here's like the foundational stuff you should be thinking about. Um, it's gotten really good reviews. The paperback came out in uh, about two years ago. Virox, I, I approached Virox and the Joni Bernard Foundation and they've sponsored the playbook. But the reason I'm so happy to have your attention today is to tell you that the ebook is now available. I know Allison was putting it in the chat. It's on Amazon and also available on Apple Books. And the hard copy is available on Amazon as well. Limited time offer if you order a hard copy. I am currently shipping and handling because my company went out of business. The printer went out of business um, because of COVID. So uh, until that transitions, you can get a signed copy. Uh, and, and this is my website, Team Shelter USA. I also am faithfully posting on Playbook, um, on Facebook every two months. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time and attention. Thanks for listening. And thank you to Haas. Uh, wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Paisano. Does anybody have any questions? Um, after that amazing presentation, so much information there. Um, if you have a question, now's the time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Paisano. We're so glad to work with Team Shelter USA. Um, I want to turn it over to Amy Nichols now, um, who has a, an announcement to make, and then we're going to get on to our, our conversation of the day. So Amy, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so today, I'm very excited to share two big announcements from Shelter Animals Count. Um, so first is that we have hired a new executive director. We're all very excited about. Uh, Stephanie Filer will be joining us as the new ED for Shelter Animals Count. If you're not familiar with Stephanie, she spent the last 10 plus years at the Animal Rescue League of Iowa leading uh, development, communications, fundraising, all kinds of things. So we are thrilled that she's gonna be joining us here shortly. I'm sure you'll start seeing her on calls and uh, really getting engaged in the national animal welfare scene. And then secondly, we also just signed a partnership with Kinship to be our technology partner. So huge, huge advancement for Shelter Animals Count. There are so many things we've been wanting to do to improve the database, to create APIs for automatic downloads from shelter software, which we're super excited about. So two big things for Shelter Animals Count. Um, thank you all for your continued support of it and contributing your data. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, now I wanna welcome um, Lisa LaFontaine who is uh, both the uh, CEO and president of um, Humane Rescue Alliance in Washington, D.C., and a founding uh, Human Animal Support Services board member who's been so instrumental in leading our project um, and is here today to talk um, to help lead us in a conversation about a topic that apparently has been a hot topic for a little while. So, Lisa, thank you so much for being here and over to you.
And I can't hear you. I don't know if others, we can't hear you. We can see you. Maybe ask her to um, quickly log out and log back in again. Yeah, if you want to leave and come back. Zoom has been a little bit funny. Has anybody else had weird Zoom issues lately? OK, good. I've had some really wild. Because her mic is on. There we go. I had the other date, none of my Zoom meetings would start. I couldn't start them. That was really stressful. I I don't know. When Catherine said a conference in November in New Orleans, I was like, I am gonna go buy my ticket today. Were any of you like, yes, let's go? That is like a, that just makes me so happy. I cannot wait to get have an excuse to go back to New Orleans. Well, I think everybody should plan to be there. I think we all have been apart for so long and I miss all of my friends and colleagues and I made new friends and colleagues during COVID. So I can't wait to hug them and meet them in person. So yes, everybody needs to plan to be there. It's New Orleans, it's gonna be awesome. Someone mentioned something in the chat about hugging and it just gave me a warm fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yes, Allison, tell us what's happening next week with our uh, holiday hiatus since we have a little bit of break while we wait for uh, Lisa to be able to. There's Lisa, we'll post it in the chat. Um, hopefully everybody's getting up for 4th of July celebrations in person wherever you are. Uh, just uh, we will make a note that the Friday before July 2nd and the Monday of the actual holiday, we will not be having uh, these meetings. So we'll post that as many places as we can. So Lisa was on. Okay. Can you hear me now? We hear you. Yay, okay, fantastic. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was just saying, I just came back from the St. Hubert's neonatal kitten unit. It's a NICU. And if ever you're on the East Coast, I would strongly encourage you to go there. It's the happiest place in the world. I've decided it's what I wanna do after I'm CEO. Um, but what we did is we, because so many animals were in foster care, we converted one of our, um, adoption centers into a neonatal kitten ward, which is full of incubators and kittens being brought back from the brink of death. And I'm just so inspired and on a high right now. And um, if any of you want to start a NICU, um, send me a message, put your name in the chat. I'll put you in touch with our um, rock star, Sam Friedman, who um, can bring a kitten back from 99.9% .9 being dead um, to robust life. So had to put a plug in for that work. I'm so jazzed up. Um, Dr. P, that was amazing. And we are so in sync in what we're talking about this morning because I want to talk a little bit about perspective. And I want to tell a story. I told Kristen this story of um, our leadership meeting last week. Um, and we'll go back to the story at the end. But people have been talking about how we're just overwhelmed with intake and we're not having enough time to do adoptions well. And we have so many animals and we don't have enough staff. And so I, I read them a memo that um, was on my computer and I just wanna read it to you. And it's called Save Our Summer. And it's just about what happens, what's happening to us right now and how we feel. And it's, uh, here it is. Sorry, this memo has been so long in the making. We sat down and drew up a population plan the day after we heard from you in our staff meeting. 
and this is our first chance to get it off to you. We've all talked about summer's impact on us, and some of the things we've acknowledged are that any meeting we have has grown longer and harder, that talking about animals feels like a struggle, that it feels like we didn't do any euthanasia, and now we're doing euthanasia all the time, that every summer is like this, but this is harder, that we don't want to deal with each other, we don't want to deal with customers, and the feeling of all the progress we made in the last year has now leveled off. And the memo goes on for three pages, talking about just what it's feeling like um, to be in a busy and overwhelmed shelter. And I just want to share my screen for a minute. And I want you to look at the date of the memo. It's the first memo I ever got in animal welfare. It was, uh, I got it when I was a volunteer at the Monadnock Humane Society. It was written in July of 1995. Um, and I think perspective is important because we know everything is different than it was 26 years ago. And um, yet we all feel that way right now. And um, I am hearing wherever I go, whether it's my own organizations or talking to other organizations that they are living in the world of this memo. And it's really gotten me thinking that I think the most important thing about problems is you have to solve for the right problem, right? You can't you can't solve the problem people are bringing to you. You have to make sure to ask the questions to, to solve for the right problem. And, um, you know, what we know is if you actually look at numbers and data, this year is better than before the pandemic. Our intake is down. Our euthanasia is down. Animals are being cared for in foster care. Um, we have literally a thousand more foster families. And I could just go on and on of every key metric and say why it's so profoundly different in 2021 than it was in 2019. And, um, and I've been thinking about what is really going on because I, I don't know what all of your numbers are. I'm sure that you know not everybody's numbers are rosy, but, but they're probably better than people think. And I think it's just really important to look at numbers at times like this when we feel overwhelmed. And, you know, what's, I want to give ourselves a, a bit of um, just a forgiving cloak that we can put on that if you look at what's happening, we've had a really unfortunate confluence of events and that we're coming out of the pandemic and into kind of more public and connected operations at the same time summer is coming and kitten season is coming. And so we have this unique moment where those two things are colliding. And I think it's making it just feel a lot worse than it really is because we've had the most bizarre um, and painful year in many of our lives. Um, we have been unable, if you're an extrovert, you're probably so depressed right now. If you're an introvert, you're probably even done with being an introvert. Um, we don't have our cope, normal coping mechanisms. Like Gina said, we can't wait to hug each other. We haven't hugged each other. And so we're depleted. We're so depleted and our staffs are depleted. And so I, I just think perspective is important and realizing that it's not really that things have gotten worse in sheltering. It's that we've just had the hardest year of our lives where our coping mechanisms are unavailable to us. And, um, you know, I've thought a lot about what to do about that. And, and I think certainly putting the real facts in front of people is part of it. Um, but I was talking to one of our adoption counselors yesterday and, and they said, yeah, but the facts don't really help us. Um, so then, okay, what do you do then if the facts don't help? And, and so I think part of it is just really encouraging people to do the self-care, looking for we're good as an industry at, at, or we're getting better as an industry at dealing with compassion fatigue. But most of the time we ask people to deal with it individually. You know, we ask them to go to a course or, or you know, take a walk or do something on their own. And I just think as organizations, we have to look at organizational compassion fatigue, which is really different than individual compassion fatigue. And, um, and so how, you know, we're looking at little things like doing mindfulness exercises at the beginning of every single meeting, making sure that people get on walks, making sure that people pay attention to each other. Um, but I, I think maybe one of the most important things we can do, and this is happening in social justice, it's happening across the world, is 
help people find their voice and keep their voice. Because I think this, this comes from a place of powerlessness and just looking for opportunities to help people find their voice. Um, you know, I've spent, one thing that's made me feel a little bit better is that when it became clear that being a community-based organization was the next piece of our work, I started spending a lot more of my time with CEOs of human social service organizations. And I've joined a cohort of the, the biggest social service agencies in DC. And all of their people are feeling this right now. This isn't unique to animal welfare. Um, and, and I think there is a little bit of solidarity in that. Um, and so what I'm trying to do, and the, these are not magic lessons, but just wanted to share what we're trying to do is look at the things that we've learned during COVID that were better than we ever expected and figure out how to grow it. Um, all those foster homes. Um, I, I think that one of the most beautiful things I've seen is when our foster families created community themselves without us. And I just was really moved to think of these people who were isolated from their family and their friends and in their home, but they were making new friends because they were fostering with us and they were making friends around animals. And this social lubrication that we know animals have went virtual. And now I think our challenge is to bring it back into the real world, bring it back into our neighborhoods and our communities and make sure that those connections continue. Um, and I think that, I know for me, I wanna do more listening than talking to our staff right now so that I'm really paying attention and, um, and I'm struggling the, to find the balance of not asking too much, but asking enough, because I think sometimes just getting out of a rut and doing more and having more success actually lifts you up and makes you feel better. Um, and so I'm just curious if other people are experiencing this and if this resonates. Um, I was, I was my, my husband, who some of you know, is an organization change consultant. And I was talking about this feeling of, it, it just feels like the community is wanting more for us. And he looked at me and he said, so are you complaining the fact that the people that need your services are coming to you for services? And I mean, I think that's an important perspective too, right? Is when we're busy, it's, it's because we've succeeded. People are coming to us because we're safe and we're helpful and we're a solution. Um, so I guess my message is just focusing on the perspective and focusing on the power of being powerful and using the voice because we get into this funk when we feel powerless and we, we get into this funk when we feel like we don't have a voice. Um, so I'll stop there. And I, I know one thing that I've resolved to do, I, I kind of couldn't believe it when I saw that memo and how, how present it felt. And I do think that there's some things we can do in the next months as leaders and as a movement to get ready for next summer um, so that we can break this 26 year cycle or more and hopefully get to next summer and have a sense of hope and empowerment. But we've just, the work that we're doing right now, just this group of people who've come together, this is the future of our work. And I would just encourage us not to feel at all dispirited because, um, the fact that people are coming to us means we've succeeded. The fact that we have more complicated work means that we've succeeded. Um, and I think most importantly, the fact that it's clear animals are family means we've succeeded. And um, anyway, just, just a few thoughts about that. So I I'm just thank everybody who's doing this work because um, you know, we've never sat down, right? We have not sat down through the pandemic. We've been there every day, all night, answering the phones, being there for people. Um, and um, what we are in is because we've been successful. And look at the numbers. I have so much respect for the people on this call. So thank you uh, for listening. Does anybody else wanna share any, we have a few minutes and wanted to just leave space for anyone to share about sort of 
um, your reaction to what Lisa said or how you're feeling in this moment um, where it feels like um, the world is um, just changing every second, um, yet things are as normal as they've ever been. So this is just time for you to, to share your thoughts. And again, we ask that people try to keep your comments to a minute or less. Hi. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> what was go, that? Go ahead, James. Oh, hi. I, I just, I have to take a deep breath because <laughs> it's so interesting. And I, I thank Lisa because for me, under a minute, on a daily basis, in, including last week, just outburning, my, my life was threatened. Um, by uh, some gentlemen that didn't believe I, I should be in that space. And I think tomorrow's Juneteenth, and I think it's worth noting and pondering and giving some thought to the people of color that are doing this work uh, like I am, like Shafonda Davis and others, um, my team, Johnny Johnson, we're doing this work and feel those exact same feelings about animals and our own personal lives at the same time. I, I mean, I, I can hardly go to the park and literally go birding, binoculars, camera, and uh, not sort of feel like I'm, fr I'm, I'm infringing upon uh, someone else who believes that space is theirs. So there is, no rest for the weary and there are there is hardly any rest for people of color and in terms of giving voice i i'm really excited um hopefully um jen can drop this article in uh best friends approached us about writing well approached me in particular but i say us because i think it, it really is the team um approached us about writing a juneteenth article and i asked rather than write the article, me, write the article, I, I, I really wanted to hear from an assortment, um, people of color that are working in animal welfare space and, and friends have to, they wrote the article, part of 99% of the article, voices of color that often go, You're, and to Lisa's point, um, to celebrate when organizations actually elevate those voices. So um, I appreciate it, Kristen. I think that was probably a minute and 15 seconds, but um, hopefully that's okay. You did good, James. It, it was it was right under under the wire. Thank you so much right. for sharing that. Um, and yes, thanks for uh, mentioning Juneteenth. And I know some organizations are actually observing that as a holiday. I don't know if anybody on this call is doing that. It, um, it's being observed as a holiday this Monday. Kristen, I had a thought. James, thank you for your, your words. Uh, they're important. Um, Go back to 1995, we weren't as connected as we are today. We've had hundreds and hundreds of calls with you know, a multitude of people on it. I have more colleagues and friends in this industry now than ever before. In 1995, we weren't reckoning with the fact that we were not um, an inclusive community, that we were harming people, uh, not just people of color, but poor people and old people. And unfortunately, some of that is still occurring, but we weren't having those conversations. So I think it's important to remember that very many, many things are very different from 1995. And unfortunately, some are still the same. But what we have is we have each other and we have, I think, the desire to improve our industry. So I think that's what I want to hold on to. Uh, 
Okay, well, since we have a couple of minutes left, just some quick housekeeping items. So we will not be meeting. Um, remind us, Allison, next week, Monday and Friday, right? Or Friday of next week and Monday of the following, correct? Actually, it's oh, July 2nd and the 4th. So we have two weeks. So we're just starting to announce early so people get used to the idea. Okay, so um, we will have two weeks off and then we are going to um, be back here with a lineup of speakers and topics, um, circling back to some of the topics that we had started. We're gonna have Justin Marceau back on the call um, and this summer and as well as a whole host of other speakers on topics. Um, you have given us the topics you think are most important to be talking about. Uh, and we did that, we spent a whole meeting doing that and we have another 60 to get through. Um, but if there's things that you think are particularly urgent, please, um, please let us know. You can email me, Bobby, I'll put my email in the chat. And Bobby, can you post the link to the Barriers blog too? I just wanna um, share really quickly. One of the things that Human Animal Support Services is discovering is that um, the barriers in animal shelter policies from websites to agreements um, to uh, social media, they're actually intensifying in some cases um, rather than us going the other way. Um, and so uh, we wrote a, a blog about the eight types of barriers that we are seeing as we audit organizations' websites. So these are the things in real time and we have yet to find one organization that doesn't have some kind of barrier in their website and or um, agreements. Um, so uh, we we this is a good one to share and a great one to act as a checklist to share with your staff. But um, as directors, I think, um, and leaders in animal welfare, I think um, you, you will be surprised at how many barriers you're finding because what we're seeing is they're just coming back in. Um, leaders are saying no more barriers, get rid of them. But um, unbeknownst to them, they're creeping back in as the summer gets busy, new staff come on board. So uh, if you haven't done a recent audit, now's the time and we hope this blog will help. So um, thanks everyone. This has been an amazing now year and a half. Um, we've sustained these calls and uh, our, uh, our, our little, we've had more than 2,500 people on these calls. Um, so uh, please bring more folks uh, to the call as we come back after our little break and see you all soon. Be well.